phrase, we began a new school year, asked the fundamental question, which will be most of our just devotional time uh, today. And next week, uh, I will have the sign-up sheets for the kinds of assignments. I need to know uh, there were uh, 20, 25 books simple. We'll have to order more books, get more. So uh, I need to know who does not have. Randy's probably sitting over there trying to read two copies. Of course, that's the level that Dr. Kaiser teaches up at the seminary. I'm assuming. And I call that undergraduate work, so that's what you should do. But it is a useful thematic tool. It's, it's not a technical tool. So uh, let's pray. And uh, I want to initiate uh, the year uh, with uh, reference to the 19th Psalm and raising questions about the purpose, so it's not a lot of words, the purpose of this institution, and what it has to do with producing uh, people in this generation that can confront the largest and most complex world in the history of the world. Then what does this and every class have to do with that enterprise? See, at Wheat College, small, even York College up in the greater Chicago area, no teacher gets tenure that does not write and defend a worldview statement, how the worldview, the Christian worldview, deals with their project. All the way, can you imagine, from teaching PE to French, third year conversational French, no teacher, no teacher is allowed tenure that cannot write a paper and defend it before that man or woman's peers. So if they're not conscious of a worldview, see, I would like to require that here. What is the Christian worldview? What does it have to do with the global perspective? Not what does it have to do with this class or some class we're in. See, what does the global perspective have to do with the with the Lula chart, Paul chart. Well, directly and immediately, pragmatically, nothing. As soon as the content of the scriptures are laid bare, they immediately have application for global perspectives. Like you could do number theory at Harvard, and you say, what's the practical significance of this? Nothing immediately in class. But if you're going to use the mathematical capacity to fly airplanes and to make tanks that uh, can't be exploded from inside or outside, then you've applied that information and it becomes practical. So all kinds of information isn't practical sitting in a classroom. Is that that's in the heat of the afternoon, uh, the heat of the night? Uh, it's not time to be too heavy in mind. Let's pray, uh, show you the movement. You will have uh, these uh, one simple outline, one extended outline, and it's that way because you have tools for different levels. Of course, you just do the best you can. Uh, and uh, if that's a lot, fine, I've got a lot. It's not very much. You do what you can. That's what you're responsible for. We are responsible for. And uh, it is a foundational class. So you have people uh, that you know most about that we need to pray about before we do anything else. Chris? Uh, Ellen, I'm a preacher in the Greek book, so we lost mm -hmm. his son. Mm -hmm. I was a developer, uh, he had a problem with cancer, mm -hmm. and it is reserved to him for three malignant tumors on his brain. So, uh, I remember our great famous comment. Oh, you were there, you know that brother? Oh, wow. Okay, you know that? Who else? Mrs. Armstrong came through an extensive uh, operation yesterday. Uh, the prognosis at this level is good. Perhaps the average of Oh, yes, we did. Right, right. Uh, 32 uh, known dead, and of course they haven't even started uh, uh, with the uh, in motors and uh, properties. And, uh, so you, you pray for that. Because, uh, we don't have to know people to pray for them. We wouldn't pray for very many people if we don't pray for both people. You know. I know thousands of people and we could get more of them than thousands. Terry Caldwell, who was good by the motorcycle, and uh, Sam was in Indianapolis, 
they're going to be making decisions this week on whether they need to have it in front of the way. But you were that for I hear you. For the family, for her. Okay, anyone, anyone else? Yes, sir. My father has been because I can't do anything about it anyway. You'll do that? We pray for Sam. That's hard see, to be away. Uh, even doctors would keep the available. City. Any, anyone else? You word those prayers about those who go to be. And see, be careful. Do not pray about school until you've studied the best you can. It's immoral to pray when there's no preparation in the school. You know, God, it's exam time, it's paper time. You know, give me something about something. Make this important, even though I know it isn't. Uh, don't don't pray to the creator of the universe. Let's see about at that time. That's a long time to pray. Okay. No, no one else. Okay. Uh, we have uh, fine. Man, uh, uh, Reese Bryant's here. But when Jew and I were in Japan uh, this uh, summer, uh, we met the most influential Church of Christ man in all of Japan, the Morisan. And he's coming to school here as soon as arrangements. He's giving lectures at Abilene in February. And he and the second most influential Church of Christ man in Japan want to study here just because of 10 days conversation with what's his name. Mr. Nomura came with 400 Japanese Christians in 1950s to be trained in American institutions in our heritage. And two of them went back. Mr. Nomura-san was one of the two and the other man died. The rest of them stayed in the United States. special person and wants to come to school here and because he has a global vision he said be surprised when you have a large vision how trivial things aren't nearly as important as you were led to think let's pray <coughs> the smaller outline will give you some direction because all of you don't have the book except I can only apologize, I can't do anything more about it than that. This class, technically called Foundations of Theology, Theology of Promise, its primary intention is to test uh, a claim about the center, the center of the scripture. And if you know anything about classical theology, the center of scripture in, say, classical Lutheran is law and grace. See, the Old Testament is law and the New Testament is grace. I do not think that that is exegetically what the Bible says, though it is held by 10, 12 million Lutherans. I do not believe the Bible is a level Bible, that the Old Testament is nothing more than some more Bible in the New Testament. We'll talk about those more precisely. I also do not believe in our heritage. Some of you are not necessarily in that heritage. Uh, our heritage uh, from Campbell forward talked about the covenant. See, as a matter of textual fact, I do not believe the New Testament so presents that. That it is the theology of promise that is the ground of covenant. That is the ground of law and grace. We'll take that throughout the scriptures, both Old and New Testament. I have, and hope to have for all of you, I have uh, uh, 
an 18 page syllabus that, that we use in hermeneutics class uh, for the use of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now that technically is the point of test, but that's beyond what most here are or can do at this time. How does the New Testament employ the Old Testament? And we'll check 10 or 12 central passages, but not hundreds. There's 1,400 quotations and allusions to the Old Testament and the New Testament. And this is over authority, revelation, inspiration. Sometimes it's neither a Masoretic text, Septuagint text, no known text. And whole arguments are contingent on those texts. So we'll look at some of that later. If you do Hebrew only, I have, I'm doing some, uh, I write out technical things and I talk superficially, practically. I have papers that's part of a hundred page paper to have so far defending the uh, compositional structure of the Pentateuch for its unity. And uh, I believe from a literary analysis that the Pentateuch is uh, a unified document and that has theological ramification. The first thing I'm going to ask you to read for next week is the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Now technically I will exegete 9 or 10 verses of that material in creation class on Thursday, not in this class, but I must show that that is a hermeneutical matter first 11 chapters of Genesis. I do not, there's no point, there's several lines of Hebrew, analysis, grammar. If you do Hebrew, I will share with you some of these preliminary statements uh, uh, from uh, my efforts to defend the unity of, uh, of literary unity of the Pentateuch. Now you realize if you were in a real school, there wouldn't be any reputable scholar who would say in public that he believed in the unity of the Pentateuch. If you want a way out of the academic union, you announce to someone that you believe in the unity of the Pentateuch and you're finished. You'd be invited for no more papers. You'd be invited to speak no more, because they think if you're brain dead enough to believe that, that you surely shouldn't be encouraged to be out in public anyway. But if you do heap, I'm holding on to those, I have several more, but they can't help you if you don't do any Hebrew at all. You'd have to do second year Hebrew for these to be of help. Okay. But I, I'm defending something that's larger than this class. It's about the intention of the scripture. Now the smaller item, uh, the book that is a very important book, Terry's book, is not available, but it is on reserve or in our library. If you mean business, and some can, and some can't, and some won't, and some will. Uh, I'd encourage you to read that book. That's a much heavier book than the book we have to read, okay? You don't have to read it. Be in an academic situation, you don't have to do anything. But if you want to amount to anything, you do. Okay. So look at uh, that book besides this. You will have a class report, because there's so many in here. You're going to have to get a friend. You're going to have to at least have one friend in this class. And uh, uh, you're going to have to share chapters. There's just not enough chapters, and there's no point three people giving a report on the same chapter. So by next week, we've got to sign up, because in four weeks, we have to start on this book, and in six weeks, we have to start on the papers. And that'll be clear to you in the sheets next time, I'll bring it. But it, at least two, that way I think it would be enough chapters, and if not, we'll have to uh, get some of the tougher chapters. And then you report on sections. And there will be a 10 or 15 minute public report with a one or two page exposition of this chapter. Every chapter can be used as a lesson for some kind of foundation for a sermon. But if you study the Bible, you have more sermons than you've got places to preach. See, if you have preaching problem is because you're not studying. That's your main difficulty. So there'll be a written paper. Something has to have, if we mention it, you know, out loud, uh, it has to have some semblance 
Now, not full load, but some semblance of graduate work. We need something like 20 pages. See, anything less than that is just a kind of a senior seminar type of thing, which is beautiful, it's just not very much. But to a senior, it may seem like an awful lot of evil, you know, I realize that. I appreciate you mentioning suffering, suffering. Um, uh, it was in Singapore, uh, the largest gathering of the congregation in Singapore in its history. I'm only telling you for something else, not because I was there. They did come because I was there. But 80% of the people were Buddhists They came. And every one of the Buddhists, I've got 12 letters that I haven't had time to answer, and every Buddhist that came to that five-day meeting said that I will accept Christ if you can explain to me why there is evil in the world. See, Buddhism denies that it's real. Well, that's odd that it's a problem to them if it's not real. But you see, <laughs> but that's, that's Western sharpness. You see, I didn't want to address that. I said, well, it's no problem. It's not there. It's just like a Christian science only think they die. <laughs> I, I was dumb enough to go to a funeral. I thought it was dead too. <laughs> and I also, in Tokyo, I met uh, an MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, PhD in microscopic physics, that is a believer. His mother's a medical doctor. His father was killed at Hiroshima. And he was Shinto. And they accepted Jesus Christ because of suffering. See, a weapon went off and they couldn't find any part of his father. He's a strong Christian incarnation in Tokyo in Japan. Over suffering. You hear that? So there'll be people that worry about suffering. We, we've got to face suffering. We've got to face illness. We've got to face tragedy. I said those things because most people in the world in the 20th century, 1990s, if they're resistant to the gospel, at the gut level, it's primarily over suffering. What about this God of yours? But there's people around the world who suffer intensely, and they find only resolution in God. It's way past, did you get A in logic? Well, writing, I don't want to worry you the first day, see, because uh, the offices could would have to close. It'd be like a crisis on the floor at the exchequer, canceling out. See, just. So you have to read a chapter in a book. You have to read the whole book, but I have to have some public awareness. And something like 20 pages. Now, don't try to tell me 20 pages can be very much, because it just isn't. And uh, if you do 19, that's OK. It's not over pages. I don't count pages. I weigh them. There is a University of Illinois PhD exam or PhD paper that's two pages. But you see there's a, a box full of computer sheets. The two pages are just the results of the work. That's an entirely different thing. See, then try to find it. This is more than I know now, two pages. So the writing will have two things. Uh, one, two, three pages at most. Uh, report you have to share with everyone. That means that everyone here will have an opportunity to reflect, you see, on every chapter. Now, if it were a difficult book, that would be more helpful. This is not a difficult book. But you have material from everybody. You not only would have to pay, see, for Xerox and copies for everybody, but everybody will have to pay. So at least there's justice. I want you to look at the aim. I do not think you need reading therapy. Now, some people would go through and show you where the commas are. And I say, if you need that, I can't help you. I just cannot help you. You look at the aims, and we'll talk specifically about them. I ask you on your own to read the brief paragraphs on page one of the briefer outline. And then what are the things that we're going to be talking about starting primarily next week? We're going to be talking about the nature of Scripture, the nature of the text of the Bible, and why are there so many divergent viewpoints about the Bible? Why, as a matter of fact? And uh, how the Old and New Testament are interrelated, if they are. 
Does the church then need the Old Testament? See some extreme forms in our heritage that we're a New Testament people. We don't need to know Isaiah. Well, all one has to know is that there are 1,400 quotations or allusions of the New Testament uh, in the New Testament from the Old Testament, which means you can't examine those passages without understanding the source uh, in the Old Testament. So one can't even study the New Testament without knowing it. See, if I have control, there would be no New Testament, Old Testament majors. There'd be Bible majors. You'd have to be able to order the Bible. It means you'd have to know all about both of them, not, not one or the other. Does the church then need the Old Testament? Now, what's it have to do with preaching and teaching? How does a Christian teach First and Second uh, Kings? How many have ever read and heard First and Second Kings? <laughs> do you believe it's in the Bible? What do you do with it? Most people don't do anything with it. That's why they haven't ever faced that. Now, if, what if anything is the hermeneutical center? Now, that's what this class is about. Looking at the claims and testing somewhat. Testing the exegetical foundation for what the Bible says is its central claim. Not what I say or some book says, but what, if anything? Maybe the Bible doesn't say it. It's possible. And you have to read the Bible to know that. The problem of the center or unifying thrust of the Bible. Now, number eight, you, you think more about that. Some proposed centers and four unifying themes, a circle, a foci, or an ellipse. Some people, some specialists in the Old Testament, say the Bible is about God. Well, that's a truism, but not overly helpful. And some propose holding that these are all things that are proposed by people. See, these are not things that I've made up. Some say it's Christ, but is that our? How could you find Christ in 1st and 2nd Kings? Well, if you're not careful, you would have to eisegete him in there. How do you find Christ in studying the text? I'm talking about studying the text. How do you find Christ in Proverbs? Why read him into Proverbs? Now, I didn't ask you if you read him into it. I said, how do you get him out of it? Reading the man is a different thing. So is Christ the center? Well, we're Christians, you say, well, he has to be. Then some people say, well, the people of God are the center. Is that what the Bible says? Election, covenant. These are some of the 30 or 40 statements in technical discussions about the center of the Bible. What is the one ordered theological claim in the Bible? So it's about preaching and teaching. See, I believe people would have, on, on an average, now not where you preach and teach, but on an average, people would have to go to church one to two thousand years to ever find out if their Bible has any unified message. And most people won't hold out that long. <laughs> and then I believe they would have to go about 3,500 years to find out if the Bible is unified in Sunday school. See, we get lessons, lessons, without ever ordering those lessons. How can people come to believe the Bible is a unified message? See, in any practical, controllable period of time. Well, you can't do this. Have some verses over here, some verses over there. See, if you get slapped in, in the verse business, getting messages and lessons on Friday or Saturday, God deliver the people from it. That would be my prayer. So promise, you test that. Now that happens to be my position. You don't need to worry about that. Just to see if that's what the Bible says. Then some say it's the word of God. Well, the whole thing is the word of God. Why some would say it's the kingdom of God. There's a lot of material about the kingdom of God from Daniel and Ezekiel forward. Kingdom theology in the synoptics, but eternal life theology in John is theologically the same thing as the kingdom of God in the synoptics. Hope. Theology, oh, these are just a few. I'll say more about those. Uh, we're not done with that. Now, since foundation, when we talk about foundational theology, that doesn't mean that you sight read unpointed Hebrew of the Old Testament and that you can parse every Greek sentence in the New Testament. This is something you ought to hear from a lot of classics. 
every verse and every chapter in the Bible, Old and New Testament, is not of equal standing as far as a vehicle of the message of the Bible. You could read lots of verses without ever knowing what the overarching message of the Bible is. Now what does that have to do with my belief that the Bible is inspired? The Bible is inspired in its canonical wholeness. That means, if it means anything at all, that I'm going to have to defend its integrity and its unity against all kinds of confrontation. If you know anything about Old and New Testament hermeneutics, you know that no first-line Old and New Testament student with some slight, slight modification, people like F.F. F. Bruce, and slight, only slightly would I modify that with people like that. But Evangelicals are not on the cutting edge of controlling biblical study. So maybe you'd want to be one of those on the cutting edge. Foundational proposal for doing biblical theology. You said, I, I, I'm only taking this, this is not the major. See, if the Bible is not the church's major, then the church is in the wrong business. So we'll, we'll get hold what all that has to do. Historical and theological hermeneutical discipline. Exegesis. See, we can exegete every line in a parable. You can identify every Greek word in a parable, theoretically. You could identify every Hebrew root in every psalm in the Old Testament and couldn't tell us or me what that material means. What does it mean? Because if we can't locate its meaning, we can't communicate its meaning. You think about that, you read the rest of those remarks. Now in number 10, Old Testament view of the New Testament and New Testament view of, we have two hermeneutic classes where those matters are technically discussed, but for our immediate purpose, on page three. Next time we'll start start with Genesis 1 through 11 asking the question if we can get any central claim in that material. A central claim that structures the Bible, not merely structures Genesis. The promise of God. See, there's no Hebrew word for promise. You'll hear that more than once. It's always a translation of one of two verbs, one to speak or one to say. And promise is prior to covenant. Promise appears again and again and again in the unfolding structures of the Old and New Testament. And it is Paul's total idea that the gospel is the fulfillment of the promise of God in Romans and Galatians. So by the time, see, we, this is not a class in Romans, not, it is a class that ought to be able to assume you already studied the books of the Bible. And then see if they can be ordered. They can't, but we don't want to order them. So we'll look at the vocabulary of promise uh, a little bit. Then three, the promise to the patriarchs, now at Genesis 12, one following. We'll unpack, start unpacking the promise. Now the promise first appears in Genesis 3.15. But you can get A plus in Hebrew and not know a thing about what that promise meant. You couldn't tell from the text what it meant. You only know later, but see that's not what exegesis is, not later. Tell me what it means just by studying its grammatical forms. It's syntactical unpacking. Well, when he talks about two things that I'll mention again, that 315, he said to see the woman. It's the only place in the Hebrew Bible where that phrase appears. Well, did the Hebrews know that seed, not woman seed? Oh yes, they're making a claim. Well, the only time in the history of the world that that makes any sense is marriage. But see, when it was first heard and read by the Hebrews, they said, oh, I know what that's going to mean. That's going to be the Virgin Mary. No, you have to wait. You have to wait. See, for meaning in that passage. But it is a promise. It is a promise. 
So who's doing the promising? See, is the fundamental problem. So the promise to Abraham, that third section, which we'll unpack the text in just a little bit, it says, in thy seed shall all the nations, all the ethnics of the world be blessed. Blessed. Well, the blessing to Abraham, see, Abraham was a heir. He wasn't a Jew. He was a stranger. So we'll look at Abraham, and promise comes to him. And why is Abraham a paradigm of faith in James and Hebrews and Romans and Philippians? He's not Christian to me. Well, maybe promise is what orders all that. <laughs> we'll look. Now, before the covenant comes to Abraham, the promise came. And in 15, 17, 18, you get a covenant. Covenant is not prior to promise. Promise is the unconditional thing. Covenant is conditional. Well, then why would the Calvinists say that covenant is unconditional? I don't know. But something is unconditional. It's just the wrong thing they've identified with the unconditional. It's the promise that keeps cropping up, see, that's in the Bible. The promise, the promise, the promise. So we'll look at that through the structure of the Bible. And then number four, when we come to Moses. Now notice, these are just things you would be thinking about now. We come to Moses, and now all of a sudden we're going to get to some strangers up out of Egypt. And uh, they're going to be in covenant relationship with God. Well, then is the promise to Moses and Israel different than the promise to Abraham? Why, premillennial dispensationalists would say yes. And if I said no, well, Kaiser, he has to sign a premillennial contract to Trinity. He can't teach there without believing something that I believe to be demonstrably not true. Now, hopefully, he does it tongue-in-cheek because he can't say these things and sign that contract. Morally. He can't for the money, but he can't for his soul. And he doesn't make enough money for that. He only makes about $50,000 a year. And uh, that's not enough money to risk. Well, we'll look at Abraham. Love me. And the Bible said we're going to be at the Bible. Now I have papers on, see, the three prongs that we can deal with just in a very superficial sense in this class. There are three things that's in the promise. The promise of land, the promise of blessing, and the promise seed. Well, what happens to the land in the New Testament? No New Testament author is ever looking forward to the consummation of the promise of the land. In fact, the limited geography of the land promise in the Old Testament becomes global in the New. But see, it's always been global from the very beginning. You don't get global just in church growth or evangelism classes. You would be global for even reading the Bible. One can't read the Bible without being global, which means if we aren't, if we're provincialistic, we're not reading it. We just hum through it. Now we'll look at promise to Abraham, covenant to Abraham. What's the covenant for when God cuts a covenant? He has a responsibility. And then we look at Moses. Why is that a different covenant? Have we got now we got two covenants, haven't we? Got two? We've got one to Abraham? They read the peers in the passages relating to both those people. Do we have two? Well, if that's not enough when we get to David, why well, David has a covenant. Have we got three now? Well, that's why some people are premillennial dispensationalists. I said, if you would follow the theology of the promise, you wouldn't do that. Because the covenant is conditional. And the covenant with Moses and Israel and the covenant with David in the house of David is to carry out the promise. That runs like a thread through the Bible. Order the whole Bible. Not just those units of the Bible talking about Abraham or talking about Moses or talking about Israel. Okay. Now the temple. Now the theology of the temple, it's not over architecture or archaeology. The theology of the temple, by God's fiat, is where he dwells. Where God dwells. 
The Holy of Holies is where God dwells. Well, when we come into the New Testament, we're not there yet, but because you've been students, some of you, for hundreds of years, and you're Bible majors, and ought to know most of the Bible, like the palm of your hand anyway. What's the temple in the New Testament? Uh, do we have to buy the Dome of the Rock back and get that gold leaf, that billion dollars worth of gold off the Dome of the Rock so we can get this temple back so uh, uh, Jesus would hurry up and come to Jerusalem? You'd be surprised how much people make up. See, those kind of positions belong in creative literature class over in Champaign. See, the, the Holy of Holies is where God's presence. Now, the relationship of promise and presence, you hear this unfolding, promise and presence. How and where is God present? We live in a touchy, touchy, PDP world. We don't want too much information. I just want something helpful. But the theology of the promise is the dwelling place of God. Where does God dwell in the New Testament? You all know it, so I'm just asking, just you heard it. The faster you say, the quicker it will in his people. Well then, does the New Testament have a different view than the Old Testament? Does the New Testament hermeneutically expand? See the Old Testament? Because it's no longer in a building at all. And then, what are you going to do with the so-called millennial temple in Ezekiel? Why nothing? Because the temple is the body of Christ in the New Testament. That's a hermeneutical move, isn't it? you got a building where he is, but God's global. But it's always been his purpose. He cut a covenant with Israel for Israel to share his purpose. Israel failed to share his purpose. And he creates a people to share it. But see, he created Israel to share it. They just didn't do it. All right, there's a whole lot of things in the hopper there. Well, dwelling places. There. What does that have to do? Well, where does God dwell? Where is his promise that he will dwell? Old and New Testament. And then the house of David. You know about David, but in 2 Chronicles. Now, many right-wingers take 2 Chronicles and apply that to America. As far as I know, America has no covenant with God to finish carrying out the purpose of God. Nor do I know anyone who knows that America has a covenant with God. Not only am I limited, all the people I know are just as limited as I am about that. But what happens? Now we have a promise to Abraham and a covenant. We have a promise to Moses and the house of Israel and a covenant. You know that is the Pentateuch. That's why the unity of the Pentateuch is absolutely essential. Not to crack the fundamentalistic mindset about, well, Moses. See, the Hebrew text doesn't say one time that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Not one time. But I believe he wrote it because other people said he did. But the text doesn't say it. It's like Hebrews. Paul could have written it, but I have no time to discuss that your cousin wrote it. You know, it sounds just like your cousin. The text doesn't say it. And there's no evidence for it. So why spend much time except to announce that there's no ground for the discussion? So you can discuss things, because no one can refute a position like that. See, there's no counterfactual data. <laughs> now, the most troublesome when we work, you know we can't even devotionally, let alone have a semblance of exegesis, and we'll discuss that just a little bit. We can't even look at this, and this is not all of it, it's just some of it. We're after how, if at all, the Bible, the Bible has a message. What is it? Does it change? Does God change? When the house of David in 2 Chronicles 7, he promised David in his house. Well, David's son was in no condition to carry out the book. And that becomes messianic. And from the 8th and 7th century forward, the promise will become messianically interpreted in the text. See, the promises to Abraham, how's that to be worked out? We don't know how it's to be worked out. The promise to Israel, the promise to Moses, the promise to David, how's it to be worked out? See, by the 8th, 750, like that, it was fun under the Messiah. 
And when we look at Amos and Hosea, how it's used in the New Testament, not only, but for our limited purposes, Romans, I'll have a paper on that for you. Uh, the author of Romans and Galatians uses Hosea and Amos to make the point that the Church of Jesus Christ is the very thing that Amos and Hosea talk about. Now that's one of two things. God needs to be for a hot Wednesday afternoon. That's either distortion of material or it's hermeneutically an extension of the meaning because the original text of that one was this one. And in the New Testament, the meaning of the text has been expanded. Now we have about five of the 14 or 15 papers that contain technical things and don't be bothered about the issue. You need to be bothered about the issue, but if that's too much for you, well, just make sure it's too much for you before you get in. Now the technical problem about promise theology, it doesn't seem to be in the wisdom literature. Oh, it's all over the wisdom literature, but there are technical articles that say, no, no, it's not in my wisdom literature. I just say they don't have enough wisdom to know that. And then the prophets. See, what we're doing is looking at the literary units of the Bible to see textually, textually, what the text, not a verse, but the text as a whole, says it is centered. I propose for your consideration, that's all. It's not brainwashing, no effort to do that. That the unity of the Bible, Old and New Testament, for the promise of God in the universe, it is a complementing event. It is not like one of the other events. I do not talk about the second coming of Christ for several reasons, but specifically the New Testament doesn't talk that way. That phrase is not in the New Testament. And if you're not careful, people will think that the coming of Jesus is just one of the events in history. Oh no, that's not just one of the events in history. That is an ordered event that ordered the all history. So the Greek terms, people don't want to hear those anyway, but to tell them about what this is. See, if people would ever get a biblical worldview, they might even get excited about going to seminary or college or church. But as long as they think the church is a hospital to meet their needs, they couldn't get any more excited than they are the way they are. But if you believe that you're committed to a God whose purpose is global, that's about as big as one could get. So it's over several things, over preaching, teaching, some elementary foundation of biblical theology. So the presence of God, you're looking for the promise and the presence. David's house, you look at that, page four, page five, these are just a few little things. Page 5, the promise and praise, and we turn to the temple, we turn to worship. See, promise is renewed in the mission to the Goyim. Well, the Goyim are the Gentiles. 57 times, uh, root word, Goyim. I have a paper on the Goyim. Who are the Goyim? Why, they're not the Jews. Has God just all of a sudden thought that there's a lot of people in the world that aren't Jews? No, not on the Gentile. Mission to the Goyim, revisited the days of Nehemiah, and we'll look at that particular issue, household of God. And then there's section 13, promise and the kingdom, the exilic and post-exilic prophets. Uh, that specifically, uh, we have the Jeremiah material that you'll have a sheet, a study sheet on, and I'm assuming you've studied many of these things before. This is an ordinary effort. In Jeremiah 31, that's used in 9 chapters of Hebrew. Is that a distortion? What does that mean? What is this new covenant? What does it have to do with promise? What does it have to do with God? What does it have to do with the Bible? What does it have to do with why people can't make much sense of the Bible? Uh, I'm all over the world and the country. And most people can't make much sense of the Bible. They're, they want to read it if they're sick or someone's ill. If they, if they want to use the Bible. I propose to you this early in this semester, if you do use it, stop using it. The Bible isn't a thing to be used. It's like using God. It's slightly idolatrous. If there is a God and that's his word, we're not going to use it. It ought to use us instead of us using it. So those are not just mindless little quips. 
kingdom, the whole theology of the kingdom, I'll give you a kingdom uh, union for all the kingdom pericopes in the synoptic. Now, kingdom starts in Daniel. And uh, I, have, I have a Daniel paper, uh, I have a ZQ paper, you know, because our project here in this class is highly detailed. I have all the, the references in the book of Revelation uh, that entail imagery or direct quotations of Daniel, and all the references that could entail uh, any, any reference to the book of Ezekiel, a little paper on that. So the whole hermeneutical entailment, and here's the essence when we get to that point. Daniel is the only book in the Old Testament whose eschatology is global. Ezekiel's eschatology is limited to the nation of Israel, but when it appears in the book of Revelation, it's cosmic again. Well, that's either a distortion of the meaning of the text, it's expired. See, now I'll keep that before you, if it's expired. How do you get this meaning out of this text? See, it's always been the promise of God. The promise is what justifies the expansion. Not just where you went to school, what was the position of your teacher. It has to stand scrutiny of the text. So, excel it. Promise kingdom in Daniel. You'll get tools uh, on old Daniel. And Messianic bridge, we'll take two or three passages. Uh, we don't have, there should be a required class undergraduate and graduate of all the messianic material. We don't have, so I'll not try to make up for that, but uh, we'll look at two or three passages that are messianic. Messianic. And not just at Christmas time.